Okay, so I'm going to try and talk about three different subjects, and um, it's partly because uh, the main items that people are interested in are clearly the war, the current war in Ukraine, the use of the uh, digital uh, operated unmanned aerial devices, and there is also the whole concept of the of artificial intelligence, how that works, uh, um, and how artificial, artificial intelligence will change the way drones will operate in future or other weapons will operate in future. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about cyber wars. We had a mention of it uh, during the session uh, about photography, but that's quite interesting as well. So let's start with autonomous and unnamed systems. Um, people call it drone. The, if you like, the people who use them call, that, call them unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, they are called. And um, we can see that they vary in prices. They are very... Uh, flexible, but then you have to think about their life, i.e. how long they will survive in any water. I want to make sure that because we talk about price availability and actually making these devices, um, we accept the fact that smaller countries are now in possession of such weapons or making such weapons. It's definitely true that um, if you like, very minor economic powers are now in a position to do this. But this should not de deflect us from the major concept of the power of um, hegemons, um, superpowers, and so on, because nuclear remains the main threat to war. So I want to make the proportion right now, just in case it sounds after I've talked about this that, well, anyone then can get hold of things and wars will change. And maybe some people argue, oh, uh, it doesn't matter now who is hegemon because everyone can have drones. It's not quite as simple as that. Uh, the Russia-Ukraine war has, from both sides, featured more drones than any other, um, any other wars that we know of, that we have come, that humanity has come uh, uh, to use. Quite a lot of what I have is about the, U the drones that I found out are about Ukraine, but this doesn't mean Russia hasn't got them. It's just that Russia has been more secretive about its drones. So uh, one of the uh, uh, first drones used by um, uh, Ukraine, share my screen, uh, is uh, this um, is this uh, Betar 2. And it's made a lot of news. If you look it up, you will see there's a lot of information about it. It's actually made by Turkey, which is surprising because uh, Bayraktar uh, is actually a Turkish name and it's been made by Turkey. And um, it has the size of a small plane. It carries bombs and it's got laser guided bombs. Um, and um, it was used in two major occasions during the early days of the Ukraine war. It attacked ammunition dumps belonging to Russia and there are claims, and I have no idea whether uh, these are true or not, that um, uh, they were used um, to attack the Moscow warships, help sinking them. It might be true, it might not. Um, the, Russia, the Russian Air Force has managed to destroy a very large number of these. Uh, this is partly because by drone standards, they're actually quite large. They, and they, they are not as fast as some drones. It's not that they're not fast, but they're not as fast as some drones. 
and they, fl they fly at medium altitude. If you want to be safe, you have to be higher than this. And higher than this will create more problems because then your guidance has to be stronger. So the Turks have gone for a medium thing they could control, and that's what it is. In general, something like that costs, I, I'm told, $2 million or 1.8 million pounds. Uh, so although they are expected, they're really quite expensive. Russia used a smaller um, weapon called the Orlan 10. We don't have many details of that because they've been very secretive, but in one exhibition, they actually showed their Orlan 10. Um, and it is much cheaper, it's made much cheaper, uh, there are the West, and here again, this is war. So what Western military experts say should be taken with a pinch of salt. But they say that Russia had thousands of them and has lost large numbers. Um, and it now only has a few hundred left. Um, again, the principle is the same. They have a small camera. They go over a target. They have in their memory, the image of what they're looking, and we'll look at this a bit later, they find what they're looking, so there's a match. I feel like it's like your Bluetooth sometimes finds your mobile device. It says, oh, I found it, and the bomb is released. It's kind of quite straightforward. It's not too complicated. Um, There is also talk that having lost quite a lot of uh, by, uh, by Qatar twos, um, uh, Ukraine is using a much smaller device. It's much cheaper. It's only 1,700 pounds. It's actually a variation of what is a commercial drone. I want you can buy. If you go to a website that sells drones and go to a park, and use it. So it really is, okay, it's on the higher scale of the commercial ones, but it still um, is a small drone. It can be fitted with very small bombs. And so in terms of tanks, it's not very useful, uh, but um, on the other hand, you can have a lot more of these and you can waste a lot of more of these and not worry too much. Its flying distance is limited. It can only go 30 kilometers, 18.6 miles, and it can only fly at 40, for 46 minutes. So here, you need a lot more data to be able to use this. You have to be quite close to the front. You have to have exact position because this one hasn't got too clever a camera. And uh, you have to think that um, you really need to do this. Once you have the information, you have to send this, it should do the job. If your information is wrong, either the data you've got is wrong, or you're too slow to do this, you've missed the target. And uh, the advantage they have, and the Ukrainians apparently, again, according to their fans in the Western press, they have been carrying this in their backpacks. So that's why, if you like, soldiers, ordinary soldiers can do this. And um, once it crashes on the target, it blows itself up. Um, they have also been, this type of commercial, um, if you like, uh, device has also been by, used by Ukraine and by Russia for reconnaissance, uh, for surveillance, because then you can send these big pictures. That's easier. You don't have weapons on it. But remember, you have a 30 kilometer distance, so you can't be, you can't waste a lot of time. You have to send these, take the picture, come back, use the pictures, and that's it. You then have uh, what you need. There is also a lot of talk about uh, the use of what are called simple artificial intelligence 
devices and general tools. Let's not even say devices, general tools. So um, imagery is very important. How to find the image of various, uh, various targets, ammunition, tanks, whatever, troop movements. That's how they knew before the war started where the troops were. And here, Zelensky has worked with a company called Clearview Artificial Intelligence. They use it in two ways. One of the ways they use is actually to support their own troops. So this clear view is a bit like the ones I think you would use in a, um, as you get to an airport checking with digital uh, passports these days. It has face recognition. So they've been using it to recognize who has died with, drug, with aerial information. They recognize those and they've managed to go to families to, if you like, say, oh, we're very sorry your son or your father or whatever has died. And I think this has been a good, uh, if you like, um, human relationship type. Uh, Clearview's role is not, um, uh, has so far, as far as I can read, not military, but it has helped in recognizing. Um, um, if you like, dead soldiers, unfortunately. And then there is uh, uh, another uh, uh, company that is using the, is that is helping the Ukrainians. It's the tech company Primer, and they <laughs> their expertise is transcription and translation. I'm not sure if you have heard, but there there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of talk about creating these translators that do translation in real life. What do they mean by real life? Is that you speak into a phone, they, in real life, uh, an artificial intelligence machine, not a human being, translates what you're saying to a Spanish resort person or a library in Moscow, whatever you're using. This is the idea. Now, the Russian soldiers allegedly, and again, these all have to be taken with a pinch of salt, but it shows you the kind of the way the war is working. Russian soldiers carry mobile phone and use these mobile phones to speak to their relatives. And apparently this um, primer software not only gathers the GPS of the mobile phone, i.e. locates the soldier, but then the, using translation and uh, transcription and translation creates a huge database. So the Ukrainians get a text file with all these messages with GPS locations, and then they can go and attack people. <laughs> Quite something in some ways a worrying thing. And I, I suppose no one had ever thought before the use of this that you, you tell soldiers not to take their mobile phone because that's one way of communicating with their relatives. I'm sure in future wars, the whole concept of taking any device that can give away your location, your GPS, will be considered um, as well. Then we have the use of satellites and um, Fedorov, who is, I think, Ukraine's vice prime minister um, in early in the war, was tweeting and um, I assume messaging personally the owners of commercial uh, space companies, the satellite companies. And wonderful Elon Musk responded publicly and I assume privately. And his uh, Starlink space, sorry, uh, this is it. His Starlink space, um, SpaceX, which basically provides internet for 36 countries. It's just an internet provider. But that one is now working with the uh, uh, Ukrainians. And that gives them advanced Russian positions. So long before uh, a, a troop, troops arrive near anywhere, this company using its internet facilities can tell them 
of Russian positions. It has remote sensing. It also um, um, links apparently directly now to Ukraine's um, own internet system. So you don't need to be linked to Starlink. You can be anywhere in Ukraine. You're a military commander. You get the information via your Starlink uh, connection. So what are the defenses against these military drones? Um, uh, there are, uh, Russian soldiers have apparently something called st the stupor rifle. These uh, constantly shoot out electromagnetic pulses, and they definitely are enough to confuse lower ranking drones. So the commercial drones get very confused because these electronic magnetic pulses basically distort the GPS data that is going on. And uh, the drone, stupid as it is, <laughs> will see a whole wave of information coming through and can't tell. They've also used, uh, Russians have used their aeroscope system. Well, which aeroscope um, interferes or intervenes between a commercial drone and its uh, provider. And so because the drones are so dependent on a computer program that is running them, this distorts their, um, uh, distorts uh, the way things are going. But remember that the whole, a uh, concept of this kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, device has now become, you're desperate, you buy a cheap one and you take the price and never mind that you lose. It. So that's the way it is. The more expensive ones are the ones you keep hearing the Ukrainian minister say, US should deliver us these types of messages, these types of, Drones, and I will explain a bit more about those a bit later. There's also image camouflage used, and here we uh, we heard uh, again on Wednesday, I think, how that works. I'm just going to show you one. Okay, so this is a multicolored digital camouflage. Basically, you on the actual tank or on the actual mobile, whatever it is that you're moving around, you create pixel blobs of five colors. And these drones are looking for a very particular uh, image, but these five colors have infrared and thermal properties. So they distort the color. So to the person up there, the tank will appear more like the, this bit, you know, the confusing bit, as opposed to the front bit. So from there, they would see this really. And they are very clever as use, at using these color properties to match rural or urban settings. So if this tank was in a landscape where there's grass and hay and stones, it would look like that. But if it was somewhere like in the street, it would look completely great to be like the copies or something. And that way, the imagery blocks the way um, the, um, the drone or the artificial intelligence device or even the satellite can get confused with something like that. The problem is that if you've got a whole 10,000 or I don't know, 4,000 tanks moving, then obviously if you see lots of these funny, very funny images, you do realize there's something going on. Um, in these devices, um, sorry, these devices work not only on um, um, more low level, less intelligent, let's say drones, but they also work reasonably well with um, some of the um, uh, more expensive ones. So who is selling drones to Russia and Ukraine? Well, we've already 
mentioned Turkey. Uh, Israel is uh, a major player in uh, UAV uh, construction, advancing UAE technologies. Then the White House, I think in June, claims that Russia is not now buying Shahid military drones from Iran. Now, they are, that's the one Iran showed a long time ago. It doesn't look very, to, to me, it more looks more like a toy. But, <laughs> but anyway, that's what the Russians are saying, the Americans are saying. They have been reasonably useful against Houthi, uh, uh, used by, uh, by Houthi rebels against Saudi and UAE forces in Yemen. But I think we are talking a far lower level of war. I really think the Shahid uh, deal, if there is one, is more for pro propaganda purposes, is both in terms of Iran, Russia, trying to present their united front, uh, and then the Americans have picked this up. And of course, it's now very good to say, oh, well, all our enemies, including terrible Iran and Russia, are in the same boat. But um, um, the US has also given um, some 700 uh, switchblade kamikaze drones. They are, I don't have a picture of them, but they're quite funny. They come out of the uh, place where they've been launched. And immediately after they come, there is a video I show at the end that might show you some way this works. They suddenly open wings. So they look like a tube, they come out, they open the wings, and then they do what is called loitering. <laughs> Loitering is artificial intelligence. This is advanced. So they are not, they don't have a destination. They are not told, go and bomb this particular place because we've got 30 kilometers <laughs> or 50 kilometers from it. They loiter. They have a data bank of images, which is not just one image, not one target. They have a set of images. As they loiter, I, they are over a specific area. They can't loiter the entire <laughs> war front or Russia or something in a specific area. They find the target and then they go and hit the target. So the distance between the time when they find the target and the um, explosion is, is almost instantaneous. That's why they're called kamikaze. They basically commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is expensive. <laughs> so you have to be quite careful how to use them. If you mess up using them, you could be causing a bit of problem. And there's a lot of debate about these kind of causes, quite a lot of conflict about who went where and what was blown up by whom in the debates about Ukraine and Russia have to do with this. Because in loitering, they could actually, in my opinion, given what I know about the data that can go wrong, the data can, can be confusing, they could hit the wrong target. I, they could hit the target of the countries that wanted to send them the, the device. Um, so the current analysis by even Western forces is that the original use of drones by Ukraine was very successful. It gave them a real push. They were very much ahead. But things have changed a bit in that Russia has learned lessons from its previous mistakes, that Russia is now using early warning radar systems, mobile radar systems on its tanks to both find out, identify drones, but also uh, to disrupt their communication. Uh, the Americans also use, as you know, drones beyond um, Ukraine. So I don't want to just talk about Ukraine. A few weeks ago, they used what is called a hellfire, I should have a, this is a hellfire, <laughs> and this one was used to 
apparently, to use the Al Qaeda leader in Kabul. Now, the way the Americans present this is he walked out on the balcony of a house in Kabul at 6.18 a.m., presumably after morning prayer. He was in this balcony. Uh, the hellfire rec recognized him. They presumably had the face rec image recognition and they got him. But the way they talk about this face recognition is, look, the, the hellfire didn't hit the house. It wasn't like last year where we made a mess in Kabul and killed 10 people by accident. Uh, it was uh, it, his family. No, as far as I can tell from reports, no one from uh, Dawai's family got killed in all of this. So there you are. Um, In this part, I want to talk about going beyond this kind of drone. And, not, and the title has artificial intelligence and drones. So I want to talk a bit about that. Because so far, everything we have talked about has what you would call human medium uh, interference, i.e. between the machine and the drone. Yes, the drone does the face recognition. It does use low level artificial intelligence, but doesn't the decision to send this drone with quite specific coordinates is made by a human. So the human is important. So what do we mean? What is, if you like, more advanced AI in those terms? What makes the more advanced AI more dangerous? Basically, when we talk of artificial intelligence, just the name will is self-explanatory. We are talking of intelligence similar to those of animals, and that includes humans, in a machine that we have built as humans. So it is a system that is aware of its location, of its environment, is constantly aware, not just for 45 minutes, not for an hour but is constantly aware of its environment, takes actions that maximizes achieving the aim with which it has been programmed, but it takes these actions at times spontaneous, of its own accord, not spontaneous, of its own accord, not with humans. And as a result of this, it has not just human cognitive skills like vision, uh, audio, I don't think it has taste or smell. <laughs> it probably has smell because it could smell, um, you could create artificial smell. And now there are ways of detecting, uh, sorry, artificial intelligence that detects smell. Uh, apparently, it's connected to some neural networks that reproduces the brain, the way the brain deals with smell. But anyway, it has some of the cognitive uh, um, skills of the human brain, but it can also learn and most importantly, gain experience. This is quite significant. Machine learning is all about gaining experience. So the drone makes a mistake, but its database is updated with new information that tells it that's what we, what went wrong last time. This is how you would do it next time, right? And this might not be just the drone, but the uh, central unit that controls the drone. So you have an intelligent device controlling the drone the communication in the communications hub that is not using humans. And in that way, you could say this is the, if you like, um, higher stage, advanced stage AI. I think the lower level AI we use every day. We just don't call it AI. When you use Google, you are using AI because Google has been given this huge database, some of it commercially moved up and down because there is a lot of net. But um, Google, Amazon, YouTube, they all use um, a, a level of artificial intelligence. 
but also uh, the devices we use, such as uh, Siri on our phone, Alexa in Amazon, where people apparently, I don't know how long, but apparently use it to tell the TV to change channels. You don't need to uh, use your hand. You say, Alexa, I want BBC One, I want Netflix or whatever, and it changes channel for you. So it's a voice recognition that has somehow learned your voice. Apparently, when you first talk to it, it's not very good, but it learns your voice gradually and gets better at it. And um, it's a medium level um, AI machine. Tesla cards are. Um, uh, another example of um, AI. And increasingly, we see that they are becoming more and more uh, effective. It covers a large array of um, what I would call human problem solving um, uh, areas. It does use formal logic. So there are programs that use basic formal logic to tell it, you come to this decision, do this if the conditions are like this, or do that if the conditions are like this. And in the last um, 20 years, I would say the 21st century, we have made humans have made major advances in what I would call mathematical statistical machine learning. Mathematical statistical in one go. How does that work? So you have the maths, you know how regression works, how linear regression works, how multiple regression works. You then add to this statistical information. So at all times, the computer tries to deal with both the maths and the logic it's been given, but also compares it to statistics. This is how weather forecasts are done in a way. You know, weather forecasts gather lots of information. You constantly then compare it with statistics of last year's information and you make some, uh, and the conditions as thousands of variables coming in there. So the technique has improved but I would say it's still facing quite a lot of problems. Um, I'm going to show you a bit of code because I think um, we also had a similar thing. Okay, so uh, this one uses um, regression. Uh, the, it's not very adventurous, to be honest. The program, everyone who's using machine learning and I come across not just in the institution I work, but globally, I see what other people are doing. They're all using very similar program. One of the most dominant ones is Python. Python uh, is closer to human language than other languages. Then you have to translate this for the computer to understand. So there is an assembler in Linux, in my case, which translates this Python code for the machine to understand. But basically, it uses, okay, quite sophisticated maths in modules such as NumPy, SciPy, and so on. But what it does is mathematical optimization methods that um, allow the machine to learn. So you teach the machine something very simple to start with, make this more complicated, give it lots of statistics, compare the results with the statistics. So the computer predicts, given the math you've given, what will happen. You then let the computer also see the, the statistics. And we, by choosing between the two, by using the regression, the computer eventually gets better and better. I give you an example of this in lower level artificial intelligence. We transcribe occasionally talks on OC online communist forum to uh, written articles, right? And very often, if the person has an American accent, the transcribing gets much better because the stupid machine has given a lot of statistics, which is American accent. When you use 
a northern English accent or a God forbid a Scottish accent, things get very confusing. And the machine writes all sorts of nonsense, or when it can't, it puts dot, 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 I don't know type of thing. So this is really how all of that works. Um, and it's this use of artificial intelligence in drones that is becoming the trend. This is the worrying bit. If you see computer scientists, AI experts who are now talking of control of artificial intelligence UAVs, this is the kind of device they are talking about. They talk not of actually even large machines, they are talking of very small devices with image recognition chips on them, who will work like swarms, right? That's the image that the US has at least of the way these will work. And each device will be controlled or will be self-contained, either controlled by a program without human interference, uh, or they will have their own decision-making in a tiny chip. Now, connecting to that chip is easy. You could just have that chip connecting to a device, but that device is not going to be a human, right? And they think, at least the, the supporters of artificial intelligence small devices tell you that removing the human intervention makes them A, more accurate, to more spontaneous and faster, much faster. Because the human takes, say, 20 seconds to see the image, make a decision. These make it in one second. You've taught with statistics and math how to make quick decisions. The decision is made there and then, and things move fast. There are problems with this. Um, and uh, there are also examples of how this um, has been tested in various um, applications, <laughs> various ways of using it. The Americans have something called uh, fire and forget. That's uh, the name they use. <laughs> you basically launch one of these and forget about it because it has the loitering, it has the intelligence, it has the artificial brain, and you forget about it. The only thing is the poor bastard who gets it won't forget about it, will it? I mean, you know, the Americans have forgotten about it, but uh, um, there are, between the human intervention and, be, and this higher level of artificial intelligence, because there's low level artificial intelligence, even in the simple drone, but this medium level artificial intelligence, we have the Israeli IAA HARO, or HARPY as it's called. As I uh, maybe I have not I think this is supposed to be one, but I'm not sure. It's 12 feet, 12 feet long, 12 foot long. It has uh, fixed wings and it carries 50 pounds of explosive. So it's quite a machine. It's not a, it's not a tiny device. And um, it can run autonomously after a human target is specified. So you have to specify the target. There are rumors, and I think it's probably confirmed, that it was used by Azerbaijan, the wonderful Republic of Azerbaijan, in its war against Armenia in 2020. And it actually played quite a significant role because Azerbaijan, as a result, won that war. At least that's the preconception. Um, the Israeli aerospace industry, who is one of the makers of this, claims it's selling these like hotcakes. India has apparently uh, bought some. And um, uh, there is, um, yeah, uh, quite a lot of these then rely 
because of their LAM, which are called loitering attack munitions, they rely on huge databases. And again, on Wednesday, we heard about how data is becoming a, a tool in the war. Before who? I mean, data was always, uh, you know, you had to have good maps of the country you were attacking. You had to have good um, record, uh, spies for giving you more information about the land and so on. But in some ways, um, now these huge databases will make sure you are in a better situation. You have good information and um, um, you can, uh, I'm going to show you if I can. So the US representation is, so in some ways, some of the things that I've talked about are these, you see, this is the swarm thing. It's a tiny bit, yeah? And it looks like a bee and it makes, it has good powerful camera. So it does face recognition. As soon as it does face recognition, that's how it does it. And then it attacks people. So in Gaza, yes, yeah, so you can target either a, a, a person or a group of people, like he's doing there. He's doing um, a, a, whole, um, a whole group of people. And that's the swarm, um, uh, if you like, the small swarm techniques that I was talking about before. They really are tiny, uh, but the American image is you will use so many of them. They will, um, they will kill lots of people in one go. Okay, so um, because of this kind of scary film, the, the, the kind of swarm of little bees that kill, academics who are working on these, artificial intelligence academics are saying, if we don't want to enter an area where we don't know what will happen in terms of machine learning, we have to have control over these developments. This is not talking of the kind of things we are using now because they're not that uh, bad, but we are talking of 10 years time or even five years. If quantum computing takes on quickly, then we are talking of a much shorter development for these types of devices. And ironically, in December 21, when there was a conference about control of artificial intelligence devices, China seemed to be in favor of, uh, uh, of either a ban or, uh, uh, if you like, some kind of regulation, a bit maybe like the NPT, the nuclear proliferation. Uh, the Biden administration was totally opposed to it. And um, quite a lot of people thought that was, um, um, yeah, that, that, that didn't go well with academics at least. I don't know what others thought of it. There are ways of looking at this. Some people are talking of, let's make sure it's never fully artificial intelligence. Let's always keep the human intervention between the device and its final purpose. But then the, if you like, the hardline artificial intelligence advocates will say, well, what's the point of it? The whole point of this is we want to remove the human because humans are slow at reaction. We want something faster. Um, and the ban, I think, is unlikely um, to work. Um, in terms of artificial intelligence, I think whatever we think of these small devices made by smaller countries, drones made by smaller countries, the US is one of the bigger players. They have far more finance invested in this. There are every university that I know of in the US and every university in the UK is now 
uh, directing its computer science mathemat mathematicians, physicists to work in artificial intelligence. And therefore, the development in the West is fast. However, I think China since 2018 has made a decision uh, uh, to uh, invest and more importantly, work on what it calls big data, cloud storage, um, a civil, what uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government call civil military fusion to make sure that whatever advances are made in their industry, which is very advanced. Nowadays, there was a time when they really did import every chip from US. Uh, China, since the last, in the last few months, has made all its government computers independent of US equipment, because they think the US sells them chips that have spying equipment in them. And so China is now uh, fully, I would say, um, independent of that, and it has made major advances in, in this area. I would argue, and some disagree with me, that when it comes to quantum science, China is now edging ahead of the West. There are two different, quantum science will change all of this. All these computers we talked about so far have two logics, zero or one, yes or no. Quantum computing will give infinite options to a computer. A calculation would that takes now two days, three days, maybe a month, will be done in seconds by a quantum computer. The, the West approach has been this reducing the temperature to minus 380 or whatever. The Chinese are doing uh, what I call mirrors and magnetic fields and so on. And in their advances with these magnetic, electromagnetic quantum computers, they are probably moving ahead of the United States in the next couple of years. But, um, it's very difficult. This is an area where the US isn't, on the one hand, has to rely on at least European university research as well as its own research, because the more you do this, the better you get at it. Uh, and China is probably just relying on its own. But then remember, China has, is a huge country, has a large population, and even in percentage of very good mathematicians and scientists, it's probably got the same as Europe and US put together. In the last two bits of this talk, I don't have much time. I want to talk about cyber wars because they are slightly different, but they are in a way related to this way of new wars. And especially in non-hot wars, cyber wars are gonna be very significant. So we have the Iran-Israeli Cold War, what I would call, Cold Hot War, uh, Moshe Mahova rightly or at times tells me, well, this is not really a Cold War. Um, it started either by, uh, I think by Mossad, um, if you remember using Stuxnet in the Iran nuclear industry. This is because everybody, every industry, every, if you like, uh, every military thing is now so dependent on computers. So if you hack a computer system, you can get very far. And the way the Israelis did it was they, there is something in a nuclear plant which is called a PLC, Programmable Logic Controller. And it determines uh, the speed of the um, electromagnetic processes that affect the centrifuge. So again, as was explained on Wednesday, but for those who might have not been here, I repeat it, the way you do this is you make the centrifuges spin a lot faster and then they, they self-destroy, right? So that's how the Israelis do it. Did it. There are rumors that it, at that time, it wasn't even hacking into the system. They actually got someone to take a USB into Matterhorn's nuclear plant. 
given the number of Israeli spies in Iran, are not surprised. More recently, the centrifuges were attacked by an Israeli cyber attack. This created an electrical outage. Basically, the plant is dead. And again, the older centrifuges died as a result of this. Now, a lot of people, and there are a number of articles about this, it could have gone the other way. Instead of dying, they could have exploded. And Iran complained to the UN saying this was uh, nuclear terrorism, but of course, who cares? It was Israel, so Iran had been in stand last trap. But Iran hasn't only been, hasn't been just a victim, it also has waged its own cyber attack. So Iran attacked Cellcom. Uh, Cellcom is one of the network internet providers in uh, um, uh, Israel, and a lot of government websites use it. And Iran used what is called um, a denial of service attack. A denial of service attack is that you bombard um, the servers of a website or of a provider with so much data that it can't cope with it and it basically crashes. It says, I, I've got, I can't deal with so many requests. It goes what is called out of memory and then dies, right? And that's what happened to the Israeli cell comp. It didn't last long because they obviously, you can bring new servers, repair this one and so on. Israel also attacked Iran's rail um, uh, and transport system. So suddenly people in metro in Tehran had these things saying cancel train. And uh, in the train stations, all the trains stopped. And Israelis later said, look how we can control transport in another country. And Iran's retaliation was against the railway line that hasn't actually started working in Israel, which was a bit minor because obviously they were in the test scale of their system. But so in the last bit, um, I've just finished. I'm just going to show you a couple of films. So, um, this is quite a clever drone. Uh, you will see how it works. So the, the guy is seeing this because obviously the drone is getting to its right place. So this is how they train the drone. This is, if you like, using artificial intelligence on the drone. This is trying to make it an autonomous flyer. And it gets lots of graphs. They're all mathematical. They use the gazebo because then you can control better what you can do with it. And then here it is, it's gone. And um, this is yet another of these uh, autonomous type devices. So, See, there is no humans. And of course, the argument by those who support these is that wars will have fewer uh, dead soldiers. There are figures, the BBC has done um, some studies that show that the, during the Ukraine-Russia war, given the number of people who died on both sides, even if you take either the Ukrainian or the Russian or an independent one, the number of soldiers who have died in the first three months are less than what um, would have been expected of such a thing. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. And again, you can see this is the... Um, so the humans are there, but they are... Um, they're being protected by this device. It's a kind of combination. It's a bit like our meetings, hybrid. Mm -hmm. And some of these devices, the radar devices, if you see the older versions of these, they were very large uh, 
devices. Nowadays, you can have the radar image on very small screens. It has to be maybe bigger than this because the resolution won't be big enough on a phone, but on a computer screen, they can do it. And uh, these uh, devices have also got the other abilities that humans or planes driven by humans didn't have. It's night vision. Okay, that's it. I'm going to stop there. Yeah. Okay. Okay.